We are up to principle number five of the 13 principles of faith. And again, these principles were codified by Maimonides, by the Rambam, and were universally accepted as the, as the foundations of Jewish faith, so much so that these 13 precepts, these 13 tenets, are are the basis for, for Torah. If you don't have these 13 tenets, you cannot have Torah. We're up to principle number five of the 13 principles, and that is the principle that when we pray, we pray to God and not to the angels and not via intermediaries. So there's a few different intersecting points. Number one, that we pray. And the relationship or the perspective that we have about God is that prayer makes sense, prayer works, number one, but it's also prayer directly to God, not prayer to angels and not prayer via angels. So the Rambam, it says his short citation from the Rambam, again, the Rambam is the one who gives us the 13 principles, and he writes that God alone is worthy of our worship, and only God we should hold in high stature, only God we should publicize his greatness, only God we should adhere to his commandments, and we should not do that to anything or anyone that is beneath God. Not the angels, not the stars, not the galaxies, not the forces of nature, certainly not uh, people not things that are made up of that, so anything which is made up of, of finite building blocks of, of physics, anything that's physical, should not be the ones that we worship, anything that, that, is, that, is, that is natural, that is, that is a, a creation, not a creator. The angels don't have free will, they don't have latitude, they don't have agency, they don't have the ability to effectuate change, we shouldn't pray to the angels, that's point number one. Pray to God, not to the angels. Point number two, or worship God, not worship the angels. And in addition, we should not use them as intermediaries, as go-betweens, as proxies for God. Rather, we should focus and direct our thoughts and our prayers to God himself, and we should discard anything that's not God, and we should not pray to death. And he says that there's many verses of the Torah that prove this point. He doesn't give us any specific verse, but he says it's, it's, it's evident throughout the whole Torah. Now, when this principle, the fifth principle, when it was codified into the prayer book, it reads as follows, I believe, anima amin, the Muda Shlema with complete faith that the Creator, blessed is He, He is the only one that we should pray to and we should not pray to anything else aside from Him. So that's the idea, the idea of prayer to God, worshiping God and not worshiping angels. Now, it's interesting when the Rambam, when he describes it in his own words, he doesn't use the term prayer. He uses the term worship. And when it ends up in our prayer book, when it's distilled to, to one sentence, it is presented in the form of prayer. Pray to God, not to anything else. Now, there is, there is legitimacy to that, because the Talmud tells us that Worshipping God, we know that it's a mitzvah for us to worship God. What does it mean to worship God? So there's different ways of understanding that. The classical definition of worshipping God is a sacrifice. Sacrifice is a worship, a worshipping God. Now, corresponding to the sacrifices, we have prayer. And thus, on, on a fundamental level, what happens spiritually when someone brings a sacrifice is identical to what happens spiritually when someone praise. To us, they seem to be wildly different exercises. One, you pray to God, you're beseeching God, you ask God to help you with your needs, and one of them is you're slaughtering an animal. That doesn't seem to overlap, but they're the same idea, and they derive from the same mitzvah to worship God. But the general concept is one of, of submission. It is putting in the correct context, in the correct context, the relationship that we have with God. We're small, we're feeble, we cannot, with ourselves, divorced from God, do anything. And God is above us, we're below Him, and He is great, 
he is the one who gives us all the power. We have no power on our own. And this principle, it's important to not misread it. The first five principles of the 13 principles relate to God as, as master of all, as creator of all, as having no partner. This is not an idea that one of the principles of Jewish faith is that we should pray and pray to God, not to, uh, not to angels. The principle that's being conveyed over here is that God is a God to whom prayer makes sense, to whom worship makes sense. He is so great and thus he is worthy of our worship. Uh, there's maybe an illustration to kind of un understand this principle and that is the idea of, of prostration. We know in, in, in the temple, for example, when people go to the temple, they would prostrate, they would bow down before God. Then they wouldn't really do it anymore, but that was the practice, you bow down to the deity. And of course, the idolatrous communities, the pagan people, they would bow down to their god. You have a god, you have a little idol, a figurine, and you prostrate yourself before that god. That was your mode of worship. We do it, of course, to the Almighty. And it's a cardinal sin to bow down to prostrate before the idol. But what is prostration? Why is that the symbol of, of subservience to either the idol or to God? So there's a deep idea here. You know, humans, we have, of course, all kinds of abilities. You can write with your hands. You can knit with your hands. You can walk with your feet. Your body's digesting in your torso. But, of course, we're, we're positioned vertically because the thing that's most highest within us, that's our greatest ability. That's our mind. It's our intellect. That's everything that's oriented above our shoulders that's, that's our superpower. If you, if you, don't do this, but if you cut off someone's head, theoretically, and they're still alive, they're, they're the weakest animal in the world. Because there's no animal that's your size that can't rip you to shreds with just the power of the body. But what makes us the supreme masters of the world is because we have the intellect, and we have verbal speech, and we have coordination. And thus, we're presented vertically. Yes, we have the feet, but that's, that's our weakest power. And as we go up higher and higher, we have our superpower, that's our mind. What happens when someone confronts God? They prostrate themselves completely on the floor. What, what they're doing is they're equating their feet and their head. They're saying, compared to God, we have nothing. Even our superpower, even our mind, even our intellect is nothing. Yes, there is a gulf separating our intellect and our feet. Yes, of course, but compared to God, it's, we're so infant, infinitesimally small that it doesn't even matter. It's negligible, the difference between our mind and the rest of our body, and therefore the symbol of ultimate submission to God is prostration. And of course, even though we don't do prostration, what is prayer? Prayer is that same thing, same, same experience. That we're acknowledging the fact that we are inept, we are feeble, we are, we are weak, we are lacking, and there's only one source for all things that we need, and that's God. So thus, on a conceptual level, prayer is, is similar to the idea of prostration. It's acknowledgement of the fact that we are lacking, and God has everything that we want that we, want, that we need, and we're coming to God and begging and beseeching him to give us what, what, what it is that we want. My grandfather of blessed memory, he also added another idea that I haven't seen any, uh, in any of the sources, but he said another component of worshiping God, and this is not just doing any mitzvah, it's, it's, a, it's worship God, it's submission to God, is when someone does something spiritual with consistency. Any spiritual activity done with consistency, you never miss. That too is a form of worshiping God. When I read that, this like automatically struck me as something very powerful. When someone does something consistently, what it means is, is that there's nothing else 
that's going to override that. Nothing is going to push them off their course. They're doing this consistently and they're not willing to negotiate about it. That symbolizes that they don't have free will, so to speak. That they are limited because they're not willing to extend to activities that are outside of what they've determined to do. They're going to do that with consistent. They're going to worship God. They're going to they they're going to do some spiritual activity with consistently with consi- with with consistency, and they're not going to veer off that course. That shows that they're submitting themselves to God. They don't have a say. They can't say, you know what, the Texans are playing today, and I'd rather not study the Torah. Right? That's an activity of someone who's saying, I'm on my own. I have the freedom to choose what I want what I want to do, and I'm not submitting myself to God. I'm not saying that I am beholden to the Almighty, and thus an activity dealt with consistency, again, demonstrates total submission. That's the general idea of of this principle, that God is so in control of everything, and he is so involved in, in overseeing everything, that his greatness as a as a God, as a master, his dominion is so complete that it's worthy for us to pray because that's the only way, that's the only funnel through which we could receive what it is that we want. And thus, we also should submit ourselves, we should be, make ourselves subservient to him, we should worship him because he is that great and we are that small. That's the general idea. But the way it's most practically manifested is, is with prayer. And I think there's a, a very deep theological idea, concept, that is being presented here when someone prays. When someone prays, they're demonstrating that God, of course, listens to their prayer. God is interested in the petty, small matters of the person's life. He listens, and he's going to take action. He's going to change the course of the future based upon the request and the prayer of the person. It's an amazing idea that we're suggesting here when we pray. Not only does God aware, is not, not only is God aware when someone prays, but man can lobby God to say, you know what, why don't we alter the future? Yes, the future is heading in this path, but I wanna, I wanna change course. Can we even try the other path? God says, hmm, that sounds pretty reasonable. I'm going to listen. I'm going to hearken to your request, to the human. God's going to take suggestions from mankind. It's an amazing idea that is evident anytime someone prays. Not only is God aware of the prayer, God listens, and it matters to God the will and the interest of this person. Prayer is the ultimate example of the fact that God is ceding some control of what happens in the world to us. If prayer is efficacious, it means that there's things that we can get via prayer that we would not otherwise get if we didn't pray. It's a very thin line here that we we, we are trying to straddle in this principle. On one hand, we're saying that God is so above us. It's something we can't even comprehend. God's essence is the name that corresponds to God's essence is, is ineffable. We can't even pronounce it. We can't even enunciate it. It's, it's above us. Yet, simultaneously, he cares about the small, the petty, even the trivial matters of our life, and he listens to our prayers. And our sages tell us that the, the errors, the mistake of the earlier philosophers, it was not about that they didn't believe in God, per se. It's just the idea of a personal God, the idea of a God who would listen to prayer. The fifth principle, that's one that they couldn't stomach. So, for example, there is a classic book on Jewish philosophy called the Kuzari. It dates to the uh, 11th or 12th century. And it is a dialogue between the Kuzari, who was the king of the Khazars, and the rabbi, having a dialogue. Basically, the, the bad story is that you have this nation, this uh, nation in Asia, and they're trying to investigate all the religions, and they bring representatives from the Christians and from the Muslims and the, the philosophers, and eventually they bring in the Jew as well, and of course the Jew triumphs over all, and the nation decides, oh, we're in, we want to convert. We, we, we've been 
convinced by the arguments of the rabbi, and that's the course, that's the dialogue that sets up in the, in the book. But it begins, right away, the very, the very beginning of the book is the philosopher talking, and he indicates that he is agreeable to the notion the world had a creator. That seems reasonable. What doesn't seem reasonable to the philosopher is that the same God who created everything, all the galaxies and the whole world and all the species and all that, would be interested in the happenings, in the desires, in the actions of mankind. In general, the goings on of the world, that wouldn't matter to the God of the philosophers. And the insight that, 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 that Torah tells us is that the insight of the fifth, fifth principle is that simultaneously of a creator of all, all matter, everything is formed by God, everything is overseen by God, and God is also interested and thus impressionable via prayer. The philosophers, the early idolaters, they argued that if God does exist, he deals only with the big picture, he doesn't micromanage all the little things. Incidentally, uh, Albert Einstein, of course, the, the great scientist of the 20th century, he maintained a similar approach. He was comfortable, he was amenable to the idea that the universe's laws were the handiwork of a creator, but the notion that God would listen to prayer, the notion that God would be involved in the minutia of what happens in the world, it struck him as, quote, naive. The idea of a personal God is, is naive. Because, again, these are opposite things that we're describing. All the galaxies and all the big things and all the small things as well, and all the really tiny, insignificant things, all that, we're saying God is so great that he, can even, he has the bandwidth, so to speak, for everything. That's the, the insight of this fifth principle. I read over, over Shabbos, I read a brilliant idea that my grandfather of blessed memory, I'd never seen it before. We know that Abraham, Abraham is the father of, is the fa Abraham is the father of monotheism. He's the one who discovers the idea that God, the world does have a creator. And even though he grows up in this sea of paganism, he develops and hones and sharpens and ultimately publicizes the idea that the world does have a creator and there's only one power. All the power coalesces into one, into one being, into one entity. So Abraham, of course, is the father of, of faith. He is the paragon of Amuna. And you read his story as it's told in, in the Torah, and we don't read much about that. There's only hints of it. There's only hints of it throughout his, the narrative, the dialogue uh, about, about Abraham. How he is presented in the Torah is more of a paragon of kindness. And there's a very uh, famous Rashi. Rashi says that what he would do is he, he built his hotel on the crossroads, and then all the passerby that came there, he would give them food, and they'd say, okay, well, we want, we want to thank you. Why thank you me? Thank God. And they would say, God, what are you talking about? So Abraham would use his kindness as a means to open up a discussion about faith, and ultimately he developed a whole movement of adherence to the Abrahamic faith, and of course, eventually that became the, the nation of the Jewish people that are from his descendants. But my grandfather had a very deep insight. You know, the, the question of, of how the, what's the interrelationship of, of faith and kindness? What he said was, is that the, the idolaters of yore, they were okay with the world having a creator, but they were not okay with the fifth principle that that same creator will be involved in the minutia. He's not, he doesn't care about what happens. If God doesn't care what happens to this world, you cannot have Torah. The whole Torah is about that. You do this, you do good, God responds, God reacts, gives you good, you disobey, God reacts as well, actions have consequences, you matter, you have a seat at the table, you can lobby God. That's what the Torah is telling us. They were okay that God instigated the world, God created the world. There was the, the initiation of, of, of the world. The world had a catalyst they're okay with that. But now he's not involved, their actions don't matter. That was the perception, the perspective of the early idolaters. What did Abraham show? 
Abraham showed that even someone as great as Abraham, he was the greatest man in the world. And what was he doing? What was he involved with? He was involved with the smallest people, the, the pagan travelers. He runs and tries to help them, does kindness with them. Abraham himself, he didn't preach about faith. He embodied this idea that it's possible to simultaneously be someone who's great, who's the greatest philosopher of his time, who's the greatest theologian of his time, who's involved in the biggest ideas, and yet is going to get water to clean people's feet. Abraham himself, in his life, is a repudiation of the idolatry of your Brilliant insight. When Abraham goes and cleans the feet of the pagan travelers, he is showing, he is exhibiting, he is manifesting what God is doing. He's the ultimate representation of let us make man in our image. Why, how is he behaving? He's behaving in the image of God. Just even, he could simultaneously live on these two, on, on these in these two planes. He's the great man, the great philosopher, the great theologian, and he's involved with the most petty things, with the smallest things. And that in itself is a repudiation and a, uh, uh, of the ways of idolatry of the time and a revelation that God also, if Abraham could do it, God could do it, God could be the creator of the cosmos and be the one who listens to your prayer. God could be that great. Now, I want to add a, another takeaway from from this idea, which I think could probably be a subject of its own talk, the idea of God having what's called a hashtacha pratit, or divine providence, that the Almighty is involved in our life and manipulates things, intervenes on our behalf, both for good or for bad, or what seems to be good or seems to be bad, and that is a vast subject in Jewish philosophy and one, I think we're going to dedicate a separate episode uh, to discuss the intricacies or at least the, the questions that relate to that subject. So the way that Ramam lays out this principle is with two points. Number one, that we relate to God, we worship God, we pray to God, and we don't pray to the angels or to the other forces. And then he adds, we pray directly to God, not via the angels. We don't use the angels as our interlocutors, as our intermediaries, as our proxies. We go straight to the source. And it seems like both were associated with idolatry. Both the attitude of let's pray to the angels or let's pray via the angels were associated with idolatry. So for example, there is a very famous citation from the Rambam in his Laws of Idolatry, chapter 1, Halacha 1, very beginning, he, he gives us the backstory of how idolatry came into existence. You know, Adam doesn't seem like he was an idolater. By the time Abraham arrives 20 generations later, the world is replete with idolatry. What changed? How did that happen? How did, what, 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 the, what was the course of events that caused the world to descend into idolatry. So he has a very beautiful essay that he writes. He said there was, a, there was one mistake in the times of Enosh, of Enoch. People made a big mistake, and the mistake was that they made a miscalculation. They said, because God created all the galaxies and all the cosmos and all the stars, and he gave them he, he positioned them, he stationed them in heaven, and he gave them all kinds of honor. Isn't it appropriate that we honor those things? Like a king, you know, if you honor the king's aides, the king's officers, his ministers, that in, in, by extension is honoring the king. So similarly, we should, we should honor the, 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 the stars and the galaxies and the cosmos as a way to honor God. And that struck them as a good idea. So they started to build temples for the various stars and to offer sacrifices to them and to praise them and to glorify them and to bow down for them. And that was all as a way of honoring God. And that was the genesis of idolatry. And at, when it began, everyone knew 
that, of course, this is just a way of honoring God. Everyone knew that at the beginning. But eventually, they, they went down the slippery slope. After many years, there were the false prophets. The false prophets, they extended the worship, and they said, well, this particular star, you worship it in this way, and this is how you do this form of worship. And they made up these from their own, they just made up, they concocted their own guidelines of, of how to worship the various stars. And eventually, people forgot about God entirely, and they worshipped just the, just the idols, and they started making representations, physical representations of, of the various stars, and eventually everyone forgot entirely about God. They would worship just the gods of stone and wood, and they would have just the various uh, idolatrous uh, pagan temples, and the leaders led them further and further astray, and there were only a few exceptions in each generation, like uh, Mesushalach, Methuselah, Hanoch, Noach, the various other people within each generation. There were, there were outliers within each generation who were still remembered the idea of the one God that has all the power. And that's the way it went, and that's the way the world descended down this death spiral of idolatry until the pillar of the world, and that is Abraham, our forefather, was born. He talks about what Abraham did and how Abraham discovered God. And even though on the surface he was, he was growing up in the sea of paganism and he himself did the worship of the paganism, but in his heart he didn't believe it, and eventually he, he actually discovered the truth, and he tried to spread it, spread it in his neighborhood, and he was, he was given death threats, and was, there was assassination attempts, but he persevered. He goes through the whole history. It's a beautiful chapter, chapter one of the Ramam's Laws of Idolatry. And again, we see that this is what he's trying. He's coming to war, he's coming to warn us about. In the principle number five, we're told, don't make that same critical blunder that led to the formation of idolatry. Don't say, "Oh, God created these stars. Let me worship the stars. Let me pray to the stars. Let me pray to the angels, even as a means or as a a, a intermediary." to connect to God or to honor God. That's the mistake, and therefore you, you're advised to avoid it. Now it's interesting, as an aside, the same prohibition does not extend to other humans. Are you allowed to go to another human and say, why don't you pray for me? It happens every day. Are you allowed to go ask another human for a favor? It happens every day. What we're in effect saying is that a human has more power than the angel. The angel doesn't have any free will, doesn't have any agency, doesn't have any latitude. And thus you're making a theological blunder by praying or asking something from the angel. Whereas you go to the human, the human does have agency, does have latitude, does have free will. And therefore they could decide to listen to you, either by helping you directly or by praying for you. There's nothing wrong with that happens all the time. It's just, an, it's just an important aside that we, we can ask other humans to pray for us, and we can ask you other humans for favor. Man has free will, and therefore he can make decisions on his own. They, he does have a seat at the table, and thus he's more powerful than angels. But that's point number one. Point number one is that we don't pray directly to angels, and the Ram adds, we don't pray via angels either. We pray directly to God and not via the angels. And this is another component of idolatry that suggested that man himself cannot relate, cannot connect to God. You have to relate via some sort of intermediary. You have to find the halfway point between man and God. That would be maybe an angel. And it's a critical component, a principle of Jewish faith, that that is not true. Now, the question that people posed on this citation of the Rambam what is so bad of someone using the angel as the intermediary? If someone is acknowledging that God is the ultimate power, but they feel like their prayer doesn't have the same oomph, doesn't have the same power, let me use the angel as the force to, to propel my prayer forward, to be the intermediary between me and God. What, what, why is that? Why is 
repudiation of that prince uh, of that idea of that thought, why is that a principle of Torah? So I saw in my research, the Barbanel, one of the great uh, commentators on the Torah and, and, and Tanakh, he wrote a book on the Rambam's thirteen principles, and he asks this question. He says, "Why? I understand not praying, not worshiping." angels, not worshipping other things besides the God. That makes sense. That's a central principle of Torah. Pray to God, not to anything else. But what's so bad about praying via an intermediary? If someone's acknowledging that God's the only power, but they want to add some strength to amplify their prayer, they tell the angel, why don't you just bring this prayer to God? Why is that so bad? So it's an interesting question, and there's probably more than one answer to it. He writes a very powerful idea. He says that the way God relates to the world when it comes to the Jewish people, it's different than the way he relates to the world when it comes to everyone else. The idea of Torah, Torah is different to Jewish people. And thus, inherent in any acceptance of Torah or the idea of Torah, is that the Jewish people are in a different class. Moses goes up to heaven as the representative of the Jewish people, and the Torah's been there, like we said last time, 974 generations before the world was created. Whatever that means, it's a separate question. And he gives it to us. He, he takes this, this Torah from the heavenly realm and brings it down and gives it to the Jewish people. And it's given to the Jewish people and not to everyone else. And yes, of course, the effects of the Torah eventually spills over and it influences the whole world, as indeed it did, but there's something unique about the Jewish people. And of course, there's benefits to that, and there are consequences to that. The Jewish people are given all kinds of perks. We're God's people, we're the chosen people, we're a cherished nation, we're a kingdom of priests, a holy, a holy nation, all kinds of great things, and we have a direct connection to God. But what that also means is that we have the shortest leash of any people and we start to veer off our path, we start to deviate from Torah, right away God's going to nudge us. And sometimes those nudges are not pleasant. But the big picture is, is that the angels, they have the Torah, so to speak, or they're connected to the he heavenly realm. And what do we do? We send Moses and he usurps the Torah from them. He snatches Torah away from them. In fact, the Talmud records that the angels are like, what is a human? What is an earthling doing here? And God tells the angels, well, he's coming to take the Torah. What? Their eyeballs proverbially protrude out of their sockets. You're going to give the Torah to humans? And Moses has to negotiate with them. And Moses is terrified that they're going to consume him with the fire that emanates from their nostrils. He has to grab into God's chair. Of course, this is a Kabbalistic Talmud. In the book of Shabbos, page 88b. But what it's telling us is that Moses is triumphing over angels. Moses, as the representative of the Jewish people, is demonstrating and showing that the angels are on level X, and we are on a higher level than the angels. We're able to get the Torah, and they're not. We're able to go to heaven, take the Torah, against the protests and the objections of the angels. And it's not just Moses that triumphs over the angel. Of course, there's the very memorable episode in Genesis where Jacob has the stand-up with the angel. And they fight the whole night, and Jacob, it's like a stalemate, but Jacob really wins. He doesn't allow the angel to go. The angel's freaking out. He needs to leave, and he forces the angel to bless him. Again, the idea that the Jewish nation is on a higher tier than angels. And like we said, there's benefits to this, perch to that, but there's also consequences that are somewhat harsh as a result of, of that hierarchy. But what this means and how this actually plays out is that, and this is another theme which is found throughout uh, Jewish literature, the Ramban mentions it a dozen times throughout the Torah. When God gives life and vitality to the world, each people, each nation, each region has its own angel through which the godly goodness filters through. You ever wonder why people from Texas are different than people from California? 
are different than people from Canada, and why Scandinavians are Scandinavians, and people from France are different. Like, why are the people who live in these different regions, why are they so different to those same species? The answer, we say, is because they're influenced by the particular angel that's overseeing them. There is the Texan angel. He's probably nice and tough and rugged and hospitable and warm. But don't get too close and don't arrive unannounced that night. That's the Texan angel. And that influenced the people who live over here. And the pe people who leave, live in, in France, you know, we should talk about that. Let's, let's only say nice things about other people. We love the, the French listeners to the, 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 the podcast, so forgive that. So everyone loves them. But every region has its own particular style based upon the style of the angel through which the godly goodness emanates. That's a central concept of, of, uh, of Torah and, and Jewish philosophy. What about the land of Israel? What's the angel overseeing the land of Israel? Israel. So of course, there's a verse. The eyes of God, that's overseeing the land of Israel from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Israel has no filter. By the way, if you meet Israelis, it's true. Israel has no filter. There is nothing that is separating the, the, the nation, the people who live there from God, which is why there's no piece of real estate in the world that has gone through so many different people. Because when God himself is overseeing the land, there is less tolerance for people misbehaving. Yes, they have a higher degree of oversight. Yes, they have a quicker connection to God. Yes, the prayer is more effective in the land of Israel, but when someone misbehaves, they're flipped out. The land itself disgorges them. The land itself vomits them out. Why? Because the land itself is so infused with holiness, it has zero tolerance for, for people repudiating that. Which is why one nation's there, they misbehave, they're out. Next nation. And the, again, the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, which is the apex of holiness, it's the most contested city in the world. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's, this is the answer. Because you have to be worthy of living in it. If you're not worthy of living in it and, and having continuity, you're right away going to be ushered out and someone else is going to, going to fill that vacuum. And if you know what? If they're not worthy to the, up to the task, they're out as well. The nation of Israel, similarly, the people of Israel also don't have any intermediary, any angel, so to speak, through which God's goodness filters. And therefore, again, it's this, uh, it, 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 the, the scope, the spectrum of goodness and the spectrum of punishment is so much broader amongst the Jewish people because the goodness comes unfiltered from God. And it could be, again, the, the successes and the achievements of the Jews, it's, it's out of proportion. It's, the, the, it's, it's so much greater than their peers. But on the other hand, the punishment is also that much greater because, again, there is nothing to slow down, to filter the godly oversight, the godly influence, the godly vitality, and thus, both for good and for bad, it is amplified a thousandfold. And thus, for just a way, a way that this actually is manifested in, in the sources, the Talmud says the following shocking statement. If you read it without understanding this concept, it sounds totally out of, out of left field. Anyone who lives outside the land of Israel doesn't believe in God. It doesn't really say that, but that's how you can read it. It's similar to someone who doesn't have God. The way the commentary is explained is based upon this principle. When someone leaves the land of Israel, they're leaving the area, the region, they're leaving the geography through which there is unfiltered connection between the people, the land, and God. And yes, they can still believe in God, but there, there is a little bit of a separation of a filter between you outside of Israel and you inside of Israel, between you and God. And thus, central to Torah is the idea that we have to pray directly to God. Because while maybe other nations, there is something separating them and God. There's this filter. We have Torah. And that is the embodiment of the fact that we have a direct connection. And therefore, when someone uses 
an intermediary to pray, even if the intermediary is just, they're not praying to the angel, they just want the angel to help, you know, be the delivery boy, be the messenger boy, be the go-between, be the proxy between me and God, while it's not necessarily something which is idolatry or even will lead to idolatry, it is you're forgetting about a central point that lies beneath the essence of Torah, that the Jewish people are on a higher plane. That's why we have Torah, and that's why we have this relationship. That's what it means, chosen people. And if you pray via the angel, you are contesting the fact that we are this, uh, that we are the chosen people. And again, this is of course a, a major subject. For example, when Abraham when he institutes the morning prayer, God takes them out and shows them the, the stars. If you look at Rashi, Rashi says something very strange, or at least at, you know, at first blush, it seems to be very bizarre. Rashi says, God takes Abram and brings him above the stars. And he tells him, I'm going to rename you. You're not Avram, you're Avraham. What's going on over here? He tells the Rashi, the Talmud, Rashi quotes from the Talmud, says, you have to extricate yourself from your star. What that means is, is that previously you were like everyone else. You had this star, this mazala as it's called, this, this force, this influence, this go-between, this filter through which you were underneath the stars. God had to filter through the stars to you. Now you're going above the stars. Now you have this unfiltered relationship with God. And again, there's many other verses and sources that indicate that. So for example, in, in chapter 4, verse 19 of, of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses warns the Jewish people, maybe you'll, you'll look up to the heavens and you'll see the sun and you'll see the moon and you'll see the constellations and you will deviate, and you will bow down to them, and you will worship the things that God designated for the nations. What does that mean, that God designated for the nations? So Rashi said, think of them light. It seems like God's not designated them for the nations to worship. But the Ibn Ezra, he says that, he, he again, he invokes this point. He says, what it means is, is that this is someone who's trying to pray to God via the, via the angels, via the stars, via the heavenly realm, but he doesn't realize that that's for the nations. The nations have the go-between. We have the, the undiluted relationship with God. That is at the heart of the Jewish nation, and that is a foundation of Torah, because if you don't believe in that, how could you believe in the fact that we have Torah given to us by, by God? So there are Several important takeaways, I think, from this principle. Number one, it's a theological insight. God is aware. God's interested what happens to man. Angels, they don't have the purse strings. They don't have the ability to help. But also that man is capable of reaching out to God. When man needs aid and assistance, he should go directly to God. And man does not need to use the intermediary he himself has the ability, like we said, it has a seat at the table, can lobby God directly. Now, there's another aspect of, of this idea, and that is that it doesn't really matter what the state of that particular man is. When man embraces the role of being subservient to God, when man proverbially prostrates themselves, to God, they're opening up the portal of prayer and their prayer can be effective. So there's a verse, for example, that we say every day, Karov Hashem l'chol korav, God is close to all those that call out to Him, provided that they do it with genuine sincerity. Even someone who's a sinner, even someone who is a thief, the Talmud says. The Talmud talks about the thief who's praying as they're engaging in, in their theft, they're praying to God. What a bizarre thing. It's like a, it's oxymoronic. It's how could you be stealing, be sinning, and, and be praying? The answer is that it doesn't matter who someone is. When some, once someone embraces that role, irrespective of how they are the rest of their lives, 
they embrace the role of, of the slave, so to speak, looking to the master, of the human, of the feeble human looking to God, they prostrate themselves before God, they acknowledge their own feebleness, right away they're opening up these portals and it doesn't matter what happens to them. And there's an amazing midrash here that talks about one of the villains of Jewish history, one of the kings who, Menashe, who had a very bad reign. He was someone who did lots of idolatry and actually publicized idolatry in the world. Yet he was kidnapped and was being tortured by the king of Ashur, as referenced in the book of Chronicles. And the Midrash records that he started praying. But who did he pray to? First he prayed to the idols. And he started listing all those idols that he had such an affinity for, and of course, that didn't help him at all. So when he realized that he had no choice, he started praying to God. And he said, I'm going to call to God, and if he helps me, good. And if he doesn't help me, then we see that he's just like all the rest of the gods, and he doesn't, there's, there's no power, there's no effectiveness to it. And the Midrash records what happened after he started praying. The angels came. And they tried to close all the windows to God. All the heavenly windows, they tried to board them up. Like they have an impending hurricane. You board up the windows. They're boarding up the windows. We don't want his prayer to reach God. We don't want it to be effective. And they said to him, said to God, says, Master of the world, this man, he put a pagan image in the temple. You're going to accept his prayer? You're going to accept his repentance? So God responded, if I don't accept his repentance, if I rebuff his prayer, behold, I am locking the door in front of anyone that wants to repent. So what did God do? The windows are all boarded up. God dug a hole. Again, this is, we, whenever we read such a midrash, it's important for us to not try to interpret it literally understand what the metaphor is, what the lesson is. God dug a hole underneath his throne of glory in a place where the angels cannot access and made a portal, a new portal, and Menashe's prayer was accepted and he was eventually saved and he was restored to his kingdom. And it's actually a debate in the Talmud if he was restored completely. Did he completely return to God and, and repudiate idolatry or not? That's a debate in the Talmud. According to one opinion, he was restored partially but it wasn't fully restored. He, he, he ultimately did not merit a portion in Alma Ba. According to the second opinion, he, he did. He, he returned and he repented. And indeed, he was restored to his previous stature. This is, of course, an amazing idea. If we look at the villains of history, one of the worst villains is Menashe. Yet God is saying that if I rebuff Menashe, no one else could ever repent. Because if God's treatment of the petitioner, uh, of the penitent, hinges upon the, the penitent, not upon God, that means that God is not open to our prayer. And this, this goes back to the original point that I wanted to stress. This principle is not about prayer. It's about God. That God is great, so great, that even the little things matter. Even the little things he has the bandwidth to deal with. And even the sinners, he has the ability to listen to them. And thus, if you say, oh, Menashe, not him. This guy, he's so bad, he's so unconscionable, his prayers, they don't carry any weight. In effect, you're rejecting the greatness of God. And the greatness of God is such that all those who call out to him are heard and their prayers matter and their prayers carry weight, and their prayers can influence God's behavior. So it's a very powerful lesson for us that not only does prayer exist and God is worthy of our prayer, but prayer works. We don't go over the angels, and we don't go to the angels, of course. Now, there is a question that every single one of the commentators who talk about these 13 principles, they all ask the same question. 
And that is that it doesn't seem like we actually comply with principle number five. How so? First of all, there are some sources in the Talmud that seem to raise some eyebrows. The book of Sanhedrin, page 44b, quotes Rabbi Yochanan saying that we should always pray to the angels that they should help him pray, for, pray to God. It doesn't say pray to the angels, but we should pray that the angels should aid our prayer to God. Wait a minute. Didn't we just read that the Ram says not only we don't pray to the angels, we don't pray via the angels. We don't have, want our prayers to go to be aided by the angels. Number one. Number two. We have now in the period surrounding the high holidays, we have the slichos that we say every day. And one of the at the very end of the, of, our, of the slichos, we say a, uh, a paragraph, which is uh, the machnise rachamim paragraph, which I'll translate it for you. Those who bring in, who usher in mercy, why don't you usher in mercy before God? Those who make prayer heard, make our prayer heard before God. Those who make cries, those who make, the, those who cry out for, for help, Make that heard. Make our yelps for help. Make our cries for mercy heard before God. Those who usher in the tears, bring in our tears before God. We're in effect saying we want our prayers to be brought in before God by the angels. Isn't that exactly what the Ram says we should not do? Moreover, when the Shabbat meal is about to start, there's a song that is sung in every Jewish home. Shalom Aleichem. What does that mean? So it's four stanzas. Peace be unto you, O angels. There's nothing wrong with that. Talmud says when some you come home from shul, you come home from synagogue on Friday night, there's angels accompanying you. Nothing wrong with saying peace be unto angels. That's the first stanza. That, that's the first stanza. The second stanza is, Boachem Shalom. May your entrance come in peace. Nothing wrong with that. What's the final stanza? Say Tchem Shalom. May you leave in peace. Also nothing wrong. What about the third stanza? The penultimate stanza of the Shalom Aleichem prayer that is said in almost every Jewish home. Baruchuni Shalom. Bless me in peace. What? Who am I asking to bless me in peace? Malachi Shalom. The angels. The angels that have accompanied me home from shul. Give me a blessing. What? Did you read the Ramadan, the fifth principle, the 30 principles of faith? You don't, pray to, you don't pray to angels. You don't pray via angels. What is going on? That's the question that, uh, that is asked. How are we allowed to do these prayers when it seems to directly conflict with a portion of the fifth principle as codified by the Rambam? So this is a good question. And there are some people that actually... Skip the third stanza. Did you know that? There's people who skip it. They say the first, the second, the last, and they don't say Baruchuni L'Shalom. They don't say bless me because of this reason, because it flies in the face of the fifth principle that we don't pray not to angels and not via angels. The Machni Seirachim in prayer, there were petitions to try to change it. The problem is we're very hesitant to change prayer books. This is in the very first prayer book. It's more than a thousand years old. This prayer was, was present. How, you can't change prayers. It's not a thing that we do. We just walk in and say, hey, you know what? Let's uh, bring the white out. Actually, this prayer we're not going to do. And I was trying to figure out, is there any way to really reconcile this, this, these prayers with, with uh, the principle of, of not praying to angels, not praying via angels? I heard that one of the sages would make sure that they would elongate a certain part of the Slichos prayer. So that way, by the time they got to the Machnisei Rachamim, they were still in the middle of the previous prayer, and that, thus they would skip it without letting people know they skipped it. So let people who don't know better let them say it, but we shouldn't say it. Others say, no. Don't go to a shul. Don't participate in a meeting. They don't say it. You know why? This is part of the prayer, and there's a reason why it's part of the prayer, and don't make that mistake of saying, you're smarter than the sages who instituted the prayer, who knew of the Ramam's 13 principles, who knew it as well as you do, and still instituted this prayer. 
So it's a major discussion of, of how do we reconcile these common practices of, of, of Jewish life with the Ramah who tells us that this is one of, not, not just it's important for us to not do this. This is one of the principles. If you don't believe in this, says the Ramah, you're out of the Jewish people. You're, you're not part of, 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 of our religion. It's so central. It's not like it's a nice idea. You know what? It's best to avoid it. No, this is like a principle of faith that is so central to our religion that if you don't have it, you're out of the religion. So there are many reconciliations. The one that I saw that I'm going to share is as follows. And it's a little bit of a a hair-splitting idea, but it makes sense. One of the names of the angels is Chayos. What does Chayos mean? Chayos in Hebrew means animals. Angels, animals. Why would you call an angel an animal? So probably the simplest understanding is, is that on a certain level, the angel and the animal are identical. Neither of them have free will. Yes, the animal is entirely physical and the angel is entirely spiritual, but neither of them have free will. So one of them is going to always behave in one way, and one of them is going to always behave in a different way, but they're always going to behave within the realms of their programming. They're all programmed. So yes, one is a physical animal, one's a spiritual animal, but they're both animals. What happens if you train an animal to do something for you. So suppose you have a ball in the corner and you tell your child or you tell another person, could you go get that ball for me? And the person goes and gets the ball and brings it to you. That's one, that's one example. But you have the animal, you train the animal, the animal, okay, you throw the ball and the animal goes and gets it for you. And you say, animal, hey, hey, hey you're right, you're friendly, uh, lucky, I don't know, whatever you name your animal, inky, Go get, go, get, go get the ball for me, right? So the animal runs and gets the ball, right? But there's a difference between when the emissary is a human versus when the emissary is an animal. How so? If you were to categorize the action of going to retrieve the item, I could instruct a person to go do it, and the person can listen to me. The person can not listen to me, but the person decides to listen to me and they go get the item for me. No one would say that I brought that item from the corner, right? Because I'm sending someone who has their own free will and they choose to listen to me, but ultimately they brought it from the corner and they brought it to me. They retrieved the item for me. Whereas when I train a dog to, when I snap my fingers, it goes and runs and does something for me, it doesn't have free will. And therefore, it's just an extension of my action. When I train my animal to act on my behalf, The animal is doing the work, but really it's my action because the animal does not have free will. It was programmed, and thus it's like the extension of my of my of my hand. My action is done by the animal. The angels are also chaos. They're also animals. They don't have free will. And thus, maybe the reconciliation of I'm asking the angels to do something for me. I'm asking them to go bring my prayer to God. Maybe that is not in conflict with the Rambam's principle because I'm acknowledging that they have no latitude, they have no agency on their own, they're just an extension of me. They've been trained, they've been programmed to take the prayer and bring it before God. And thus, because I am asked them to do it, but they are totally beholden to the way they were programmed, they're like the animal, it's not considered as if I am asking an independent entity go do this for me, and thus the angel is just an extension of me, and thus when I recognize that, and that is the basis of my request to the angel, it's like me talking to my dog, of course they're totally different, they're opposites, but in this point they're the same, that they have no free will, and thus when something that has no free will is doing the man's bidding, it's the man's action alone, and it's not the angel's action at all. And thus, with that recognition, 
there's no problem of asking the angel to do the to, to usher the prayer uh, prayer before God because you're not even using the animal the the because you're not even using the angel as a as a, a go between. There's no there's no stop. There's no decision of the, the, that the angel does, and thus it's just one long action of prayer of the human. That's one of the reconciliations. There there are many reconciliations of the of of, of this dilemma, but that's one that I found uh, particularly provocative. Of course, we still need to explore the parameters of the big concept, the meta concept of the fact that God listens to our prayer and God's involved in our life and he maintains oversight over us. For example, one major question is the oversight afforded to every person identical? Or is maybe some people are, are given a different kind of oversight than other people? What about animals? Does God oversee my puppy the way he oversees me? Just for the record, I don't have a puppy, but you know, you, you get the drift. That's an, an, another question that is discussed by the sages in a very interesting way. To what degree is the amount of oversight that God has for us, to what degree is that changeable? Can I choose to have more Oversight. Well, we, we actually said that you could. You moved to Israel right away. You're removing a filter. You're expanding the amount of oversight. But to understand those parameters, it's a very interesting question. You know, people have suggested, why do I need to work? After all, God decides what happens to me. Let me just sit back on my couch, kick my feet back up, and let God parachute the money to my to my couch. It's a good option. Isn't God ultimately in charge? Doesn't He ultimately decide what happens to me at a very minute level? Okay, so why do I need to take action? What is the interplay? What is the tension between my actions, my choices, and how much God's going to give to me, and how much oversight God's going to have to me, and how much intervention God, God's going to have into my life? It's a very big discussion. There's many interesting sources about it, going to the doctor, for example. Should I go to the doctor? Doesn't God decide when I live, when I die? Very interesting questions that, again, are expanding the, the, the subject matter of this principle, and we're going to cover that, please God, the next time that we get together uh, to discuss that. My email address is rabbiolbojimo.com. I thank you all for listening. It was an absolute joy and a pleasure to discuss this with you today.